everybody. Um, I'm just visiting from the other side of the bay, from San Francisco State, actually. Um, but I'm here to um, introduce your speakers for this afternoon because they're close friends and colleagues of mine. Um, so today we have Joan Horvath and Rich Cameron of Nonscriptum LLC. And I, am, I feel very honored to be introducing you guys and to also be here again because I graduated from the joint doc program here at Berkeley in 2015. I now coordinate the program of visual impairments at San Francisco State. And I still collaborate a little bit in doing accessibility work and with DOOR and um, the Embodied Learning Initiatives. And I met these guys and I got very excited about their work because at the same time I was finishing my doc program with DOOR and the EDRL, um, and talking about embodied learning, um, I discovered they're working 3D printing and how they're basically disrupting how math can be taught to students. Um, by um, the way they're disrupting math education, it also happens to make um, very abstract math concepts more accessible to blind students. So that's sort of where my interest comes in in working with students who are blind or visually impaired. So these guys came up from Pasadena. Um, they have worked very closely with Los Angeles Unified down in LA, um, supporting their teachers of the visually impaired blind students um, doing high level biology chemistry classes and also working with students at Pasadena City College in how to build this bridge and making 3D printing more accessible and all the iterations of the word accessibility. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you. So we're gonna tag team this a little bit. I'm gonna tell them to do the beginning and then and there's gonna be a quiz at the end. And so Rich will be administering, administering the quiz, but it involves toys. It's a quiz with toys. <laughs> So just so I know what I'm dealing with, how many of you are, would call yourselves mathematicians? Okay, how many of you are, sort of see yourselves more as educators? Okay, and how many of you are just here because it's kind of a cool place to be in the afternoon? <laughs> okay, no, but because we're not cool. Yeah. All right, so, um, so I'll go through some, a little bit of background about who we are. We have a project called Hacker Calculus. And so what I'm going to do is tell the, the backstory. There's a little backstory here that, that makes sense that Ting alluded to a little bit. And um, talk about some other things we've done and, and how that led to where we are now. And then um, talk about Hacker Calculus and some of our toys here. And then do a little demo and talk about where we are. And so we, this is very much a work in progress talk. Um, we come at this mostly as engineers and mathematicians and not as um, education majors. And so we are here partly to get some input from you guys about maybe things that we've hit on intuitively or things that you're, you know, you're seeing their face palming during, saying, oh God, they should have known about that. So we very much want to hear about that. And Hacker Calculus will be a book from MIT Press. We just got the contract from that. So I don't know whether we'll still be happy about that a year from now. But we're just starting on it now. So we sort of feel like the dog that caught the car, you know, and we've caught it now. We're kind of going around on that tire. And I'm learning how to do that. So first question is, where do these people come from? Um, so we're a little bit unconventional. Um, I, um, I worked at, I'm uh, MIT grad and UCLA grad, sorry. Um, and my background's in aeronautical engineering. I worked at JPL for 16 years, and I've had a series of entrepreneurial companies since then. <coughs> and the previous company, this one, was um, Rich and I were at an entrepreneurial 3D printer company, um, one of the earlier consumer 3D printers. I'm getting over a cold, so I apologize. I'll be stopping here a lot. Um, and uh, we had two successful Kickstarters, and the second Kickstarter was a little too successful. And not long after the end of it, there was a Chinese clone for $200. So that was the end, or the end of that form of that company. So the two of us looked around and said, let's not do, he designed that printer. Let's not do any more hardware companies because there's too many people in that already. But nobody's doing training. So three years ago, we started this company, which, uh, which does uh, training in 3D printing, <coughs> architect, mostly schools at the moment, but some other companies. We have online classes, we've done lynda.com classes, we have six books out, and we have the books up here and some postcards and stuff that you can take if you're interested. So that's kind of where we came from. Rich um, did one of the earliest open source 3D printers called the RepRap 3D printer. 
and uh, he's uh, created things since he could walk probably the day before. I don't know. And uh, part of this came about that when we were doing one of our, we have some books of 3D printable science projects which we'll talk about, and one of the, the uh, projects requires some calculus, which we can happen to, to discover, and Rich thinks very geometrically. And so in the course of teaching him calculus, he started making models. And after about the fifth model, I said, this is a thing, and we need to do something with this. And so that's kind of the, the short version of our story. And here we, we, we do a lot of uh, kids' science judging. Uh, that's us at FIRST Robotics in LA this year, uh, being very scary in robotic studies. <laughs> we often need safety goggles for what we're doing. I, we brought some for you, though. OK, so here's some lessons learned. Um, so when you make a 3D printable model, one of the interesting things that happens is um, is that, this is still, this will sound stupid, that you have a third dimension. So if you go and look at a textbook for models of anything, it has a picture that's a 3D projection of, you know, orbits of comets. So this is the orbit of Halley's Comet, and the height is how fast the comet is going at that point in its orbit. So that relationship is called Kepler's third, Kepler's second of motion, I forget which one. Anyway, Kepler's laws of plastic. If you want to have other orbits of other things to a different scale, this is Mercury, Venus, and Earth's, Earth's orbit. Mercury has an orbit that's bit of an ellipse, so it's a little bit of circle in capacity. More. They're not fragile, they look like they're not. And so one of the things we learned when you want to do a third dimension is, what is that third dimension? And so with a lot of our models, an interesting thing that happened is we would come up with a, uh, an interesting thing we wanted to model. One of the first things we wanted to do was molecules. And you have, you've all seen those pictures of molecular orbitals, right? You know, there's these things that look kind of like bulbous and they're all the same projection. They're shaded and they're labeled and all this stuff. So we wanted to make them so that they were accurate and they passed through each other in 3D accurately. So we asked a chemist friend, you know, you can't really tell from this picture, you know, how should these pass through each other? And he said, oh, well, that's a good question. It's a really controversial subject right now. Go ask Bob. So we go ask somebody at Caltech, and they say, oh, you know, that's a really interesting, difficult, it's special. Like, go ask this other guy, but I think it's like this. And he asks the second guy, and he completely contradicts the first guy. And they finally say, guys, we're writing a book for, like, fifth grade science. And they say, well, this is important, and it's really changing now, and all the books really are wrong, and everybody displays it that way, but everybody knows once you get graduate school, it's nonsense. And so we said, this is interesting. You know, if you really have to think about how do things really look in 3D, you have to add information to those same 2D pictures that everybody has in their textbook, and they just redraw because they want to. So we, we've learned a lot. We, we, our joke is two postdocs are burned up for model. And I think that's about the mean. There were a couple that were many more. But, you know, what is that third dimension? You have to think about that quite a bit. So this is a model that we have the physical yellow version of right here. And what it is, is there a pointer in here? I have a human pointer with solid. Okay. So that square on top, this is probability. If I throw one six-sided die, I have an even probability of one through six. See on top. If I throw two, there's no way I get a one anymore. One's on this side. There's no way I get a one anymore. There's a bunch of ways to get a seven. Coming down, if I throw three dice, it flattens out some more. There's more possibilities. Four and five, as my lovely assistant is showing. And on the bottom there, that's if I throw five dice, it spreads out into a normal distribution. So it's a way of showing how if you have more and more samples, you get a normal distribution. And it's a very physical, very clean way to do that. And it's, it's kind of interesting, because then you can ask the question, well, you know, suppose I have different numbers of dice. This is small enough that they can walk around a little bit, you know, fell off the bit. But so we have one, 12, if you ever played Dungeons and Dragons, you have dice with different numbers of sides on them. So this one has one 12-sided die, has an even probability of one to 12, two sixes, three fours, four threes, and two coins have very different distributions from each other. And you wouldn't think that. 
and you wouldn't know what they are until they do this. So this is very popular among the set who are throwing dice to figure out how many elven swords they have. And, uh, and it's pretty handy. Mm -hmm. So you can, you, having that third dimension gives you the ability to, to put together some things you wouldn't be able to. You can also solve some interesting time sequences of physical phenomena. So for instance, we have the models here, and you can see these better up there, is um, if I have a black, two black holes, you happen to have two going in, in your pocket, and you bring them together, they come together and they go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, and then they combine and go and when that, and right as that happens, it's this picture on the left. A little time after, it's spread out. And that's a gravitational wave. So these are ways of thinking about plain gravitational waves and envisioning what they look like right as you go into it and a little bit after. And so waves are, uh, Tingle and Tess are, are challenging to explain to somebody who's visually impaired because the common way you tell somebody you can see is you stick a finger in water, right? They can't see that. So, you know, it's sort of an interesting way to, to show this. And we actually showed it to a, a blind colleague of, of Ting's um, at a conference recently. And it was really interesting in Washington to get very into feeling it and thinking about you know, how, it, how it appeared. So, one of the things you can do in all these models are created in a programming language called OpenSketch, which is a specialized free language that you can use for uh, coding for 3D printing. Sort of looks like Java. And it has primitives like Sphere and Cube and stuff like that. They can build stuff up out of it. And you can create models that you change a few numbers and it changes the model. And so we'll show you some examples of that. You can make some kind of experiments by changing the models changing some dimensions of the models. So for instance, and poor Lloyd just turned this whole story, so if I think he gets to hear this again. So this is a wing. It's meant to teach about lift. So it's a wing. Um, it's on a little stand that goes on top of a postal scale. That's the silver. This thing is the postal. And so the idea is that you blow a fan on the wing and it lifts. And as it lifts, it weighs less. Postal scales. So you can measure the lift. You measure it when the fan's off, and then the difference is, is the lift. That's a pretty standard thing to do. We didn't get that, but it's been around for But what we did do is we created a model of a wing of varying parameters, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it has all the pennies in the thing because it, it's just strong enough to just lift itself. <laughs> and it'll take off. And it also has in it a little branches so you can be level flight or taking off and see how it changes and play with it. So this is like the $2 worth of plastic wind tunnel, which is really nice. And so I'm an aeronautical engineer, and I said, I'll use open source cross-sections of wings. This, um, this dimension is the wing. You know, we know what a wing looks like from the side. Um, there are some coming up the right ones with a lot of folklore. And there are standards that were set in 1935 that are just two equations at the top and two equations at the bottom called NACA airfoils. And we said, well, you saw this. That'll be in the afternoon. We'll just do that. So we went and looked at Wikipedia, like good modern people, took up the four equations, coded them up, and it was complete nonsense. And so I was like, what are you doing? This is, these are nonsense. And, um, and he was right, but the equations were wrong. So he said, well, OK, so we'll look at the first reference in Wikipedia. It was different. Coded those up. Those still weren't wings. And so we ended up looking around in the literature, and they're all different versions of these equations, no two the same, or some of them the same as the Wikipedia one, but they're all wrong. And we ended up going all the way back to a NASA report from 1935, signed off by Orville Wright and Charles Lindbergh, handwritten with the equations, and they were wrong. And we coded those, and that's what's in these. So sometimes you have to do stuff like that, and no, I haven't fixed Wikipedia, I need to do that. So, Sometimes when you're doing these things and just encoding them, you know, in real three-dimensional stuff from first principles and trying to make them very simple, you discover that all these standard references out there have gotten messed up over the years. And, and so you can do it. So you really you learn a lot by doing just by creating a model and, and making sure it's right. 
There are a lot of models out there that are wrong. So we've done some mechanical models. That's a model. That's my that's one of my desert plan. So this model here is the same as this model, with several numbers changed. So basically we want a simple model about how plants lay out their biomass, which there are complicated ways to do it, but they're simple ones. So basically what this model has is a model of a petal, or a thing in point of view. Um, how many there are, it lays out each leaf or petal at the golden angle, which is what plants do. And um, then it uh, has a Fibonacci number's worth of petals, so it just pleases your eye. Looks like it be right. And so um, this is a... As a fun aside, the, uh, the code for uh, creating the shape of the petal was based on the code for the shape of the wing. It's because it was good, an organic shape. So I, I recycled that code and, and put in a different equation. So you have the natural plant, plant file here. And this is a picture of what's path being passed around. So these are the same thing as each other. And, you know, is it a perfect model of plant growth? No, because that would be a good deal. But in terms of getting something simple to sort of talk about how plants want to spread out their biomass as much as possible to either attract pollinators or to collect sunlight or whatever it is and sort of some basic principles, we can use that to, to talk about it. And so some different solutions when you do it. So a lot of our models are designed so that there's a basic model and then you can mess with it and say, how does this change? And how does, when you interact with the physical world, how does it change? If you change some of these, do I get something that looks more like a desert plant or a jungle plant? Why is that? And you can think about those things. And so we always want to say, avoid teaching with 2D projections for things that are inherently easy. So here we have some shapes we have here. So, to all of these. So these are hollow, as it turns out, they have lids. They were done um, by a suggestion of Lori Schindler at uh, LA Unified from the blind children learned about geometry. So if I were to fill these with water, which ones would hold the most water? What do you think? Yeah, so they're these are triangular on the bottom, those are round on the bottom. These are the same height as each other. <laughs> so, which, what do you think? Any guesses? Anybody remember, uh, I, I remember grade school geometry? No? What about those two? Which one's bigger? They're all the same. They're all the same. So if you uh, if you teach uh, if you teach uh, middle school geometry, you should be very bad right now. And it's it's a real it's a physical thing. I mean, we always see a three dimensional projection in a, um, a cylinder, a uh, cone three times as high as a cylinder has the same volume. And if you fill them with water and dump it out, you'll it's really a good way to make money. Oh, no, I'm kidding. The video, I'm kidding. Okay. So so um, you know these are these are very very visceral things here, right? You know, you look at it. And you want you have some water afterwards and prove it to yourself because they have to take a look at it. So, you know, using that third dimension is a powerful thing. And this, um, if you want these models, you, you put this one up open source. There's a link which you probably can't read there, but it's on our website, which you'll have later under projects. And you're, you're free to download and be downloaded. Last time I looked, it was 1,500 times. It's probably a couple thousand by now. I'll make them very popular models. Um, these are five area probability distributions. So this one has the same probability distribution, X and Y, same, same uh, standard deviation. This one has a standard deviation that's three times, I recall, higher in one dimension than the other, so you see it start to peak up, but they're not correlated. And then this one is, the two, the two are correlated, so it starts to skew. So it's really hard for people to think about probability distributions in more, more than one dimension, but this is a way to, to do that and to think about what does that mean for different points on the surface and things like that. So these models have gotten a lot of comments and people think they're wrong and then they go away and think about it some more and they decide they're right and they say, no, they're wrong and they go back and 
as far as I know, they're right for what the equations are. You can also do terrain. Um, this is a model by um, Jake Thatch. And Jake Thatch um, right now is a sophomore at MIT, going into junior year or something. So this piece of software um, basically at this link, now we can write it down for you again if you want, is um, takes in, uh, you just draw, you just drag a box any place in the world and you give it a vertical exaggeration and then you can print out that to me. So if you want to do that for teaching social studies about battles of somewhere or other, whatever you want to do, you can make terrain. Um, we usually make a model, that's Pasadena on that side. Um, and that is, um, that's Ashland, Oregon. I forget where that is, is that Phoenix? Yeah. I think so. Yes. So when we go and give talks, we tend to make a model of where it is so we can say you are here. That's Pasadena with 10 times vertical acceleration. Actually, Berkeley was pretty interesting. So this guy, just as a side story, um, was 14 years old when he wrote this software and put it out open source. And we went looking for permission to use this in one of our books and finally tracked him down at MIT. And we couldn't figure out why this software always started in this strange place in Maine. It was his house. <laughs> so, so he's all excited now that we've been using it for, you know, to help blind kids do stuff. Because he's and I think he also has the moon in the net. So you can print out any part of the moon. So that stuff is out there. But it's very powerful. 3D, 3D uh, terrain really feels different than, than projection. This is um, water, ice. Yeah. So each one of these is a uh, oxygen and two hydrogens. And so you can make fairly elaborate three-dimensional ice structures out of it. And one of the funny things was we, we got this part of it, the mechanics of molecular models. We finally went through, burned through enough graduate students to decide how that should work. Um, put it together, I put one together, he put one together, and they were different, and we're like, oh no, okay, who messed up? And it turns out there were two ways to put it together, and they're actually different properties, but. So we discovered that natively, and then we went off and said, we said, well, yeah, one's ice four, one's ice four, it's two. Uh, ice one H and ice one C. He remembers all of So there really are two different structures of ice. And so when you start to lay it up, you discover this and say, you know, so it's really interesting that you, you discover the physics when you are actually putting the thing together. And so one of the things that, that we get frustrated by is that there are tons of models out there, and there are what we call math zoos. You know, there's all these interesting little things. And we, you know, we try not to be a math zoo in our projects. We try to have good, solid projects where you can learn some chunk of science, but they, they're scattered, you know, and so people said, well, could you do like a whole class's worth, you know, beginning and end for some grade level and do that? And so we thought about it, and we said, you know, what is one thing that you could really deep dive into? And that's sort of where we're at right now. And one of the things we said was, you know, I've, I've taught, um, I'm adjunct faculty in a couple of places, and for a while I taught at a school that's primarily artists. And I discovered that artists really like learning science and math historically. You say, okay, here's where it came from, here's what they were thinking about when they were doing it, and you know, and they kind of go back to it and you say, get into that mindset and think about it. And here's, your Isaac Newton and here's your design brief for thinking about it. So I sort of have that mindset. And so when we were, starting calculus um, for, uh, for Rich to catch up with a little bit, um, I said, you know, it sounds like you think like Isaac Newton, so let's go look and see what his original book that wrote up calculus looks like called Principia, and let's see what some of the algebra looks like it, in there, and there isn't any. Principia, Isaac Newton's original work is all pictures. It's all geometrical pictures that look like that. And um, the whole text is, um, this one's from Wikisource, but the Cambridge University has photographs of all his originals. And there's also Newton's copy of Precipia's at the uh, Huntington Library in Pasadena. Um, so we said, well, you know, Precipia is notoriously hard to understand, probably because of these complicated projections. And we, so our tagline has been, what if Isaac Newton had had a 3D print? And you know, to start from there and say, how would he have 
describe things and demonstrate things and point them. So that's that's the premise of our hypercalculus. And uh, which is a right now a, a surprise entry. If you Google hacker calculus, you get things from someplace called hackerday.io, and that has a lot of background about where we are now. Um, we also have the hackercalculus.com domain, but we, there's nothing there yet. So basically, we said it was okay, how can we lay out calculus for people who would never take it otherwise? We, we call it calculus for machinists originally. Because this particular group has a lot of people who like to make things, and maybe they're not traditionally trained. So how can we say, you know, how would you teach some of these concepts for somebody who is not, you know, traditional academic material, whatever that means. And then the interesting question is, well, you know, could you, could you teach it younger too? Um, how many of you have seen the book, um, A Mathematician's Lament? You've been sort of nodding through all this, so we're, you kind of get it. So there's, there's a book called A Mathematician's Lament, which is written by a guy who's a mathematician and teaches high school. And the premise is if you taught art the way you teach math, you would spend two years teaching people how to draw straight lines, and because they'll need it later, and two years how to do perfect brush strokes, because they'll need it later, and then two years how to cut things straight, because they'll need it later, and then maybe in high school you'd let them draw a picture, but by then they'd hate art because art's really boring, <laughs> right? And that's what we do to people. So I think calculus is the most interesting part of math in many ways because it's how things change and how they move. It's tied very tightly to a lot of discoveries in physics, but the <coughs> basic concepts aren't very hard. I'm going to try to prove that a little bit as we go forward here. So the premise is, you know, can you teach calculus to much younger kids and give them a solid founding so they'll like everything later? And some motivation for that because we're out of college and I have to give references. Um, so 25% of students at tier one universities get a D or F in calculus when they take it. Um, and about 30, 300,000 college students take the calculus course, but more high school students than college students take calculus. So that means people get it out of the way. It's a terrible thing, right? Um, and if you look at AP, there's two kinds of calculus in high school, AP and BC, which is harder. So if you look at AB, about a third get one, it's one to five, and you know about 25% get five. So people are out at the ends of the distribution. Right? Um, BC, it's skewed a little bit more to people who are going to be successful because they self-select. <coughs> and people who fail calculus usually leave the STEM track at that point because it's seen as kind of a you know point where you keep or fail. And so a lot of times people fail calculus or fail calculus and get C or D. There's also some recent moves to discipline-focused calculus, like biocalculus, so calculus for biology majors. So to just, just give them the concepts they really need. So we said, well, you know, these are, these are band-aids, so what can you do? Uh, and so I thought a lot about how, I worked at JPL for 16 years. I'm a computational fluids person which is fairly hardcore math, usually. And I'm very algebraically oriented. And um, so, you know, I kind of grew up in the era. Um, I just missed cycles, <coughs> but uh, calculators were around. Um, but I um, worked on supercomputers at JPL that are, I figured out the other day that a Raspberry Pi is 10 of those. So, you know, the computing power has gone through the roof, but a lot of, so you have to be, you have to be very clever and a lot of, you know, do a lot of weird algebra to pack things in and be good at that. But now, um, you know, most people that are good at this will go to geometry first and draw a picture, and then we'll go do the algebra. So why do we do algebra first? Which most of the time we teach us that we do. And why can't first graders learn calculus and intuition? We do this. Right, whatever that means. So here are things we tried. So initially we said, ah, so study why things move and why they, how they change. So we built this guy. Go ahead and describe it. So this is a, um, there is a circuit board in here. Uh, for those of you who've, uh, who've heard of an Arduino maybe. So this is an Arduino-like board. Uh, this particular one is made by Adafruit. Uh, it's called the Circuit Playground. It has some other 
um, components built in, uh, including uh, the ones we're using here are uh, a ring of uh, lights, of LEDs, uh, addressable LEDs actually, and um, and an accelerometer. Uh, and you can also, you also hear it making a sound as a speaker on there. And so we built this case for it, uh, which allows so us to people handle it when you destroy yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just a spare battery. It was also useful for our drop test. Um, and it, yeah, this is a uh, this is a battery that's meant to recharge your uh, your cell phone, uh, but it's got a micro USB connector on it, which is what this needs. So I can take that off of that. Um, and so this is reading the uh, the accelerometer and uh, figuring out which side is down. Uh, but if I move it, you see the lights don't stay at the bottom. So it behaves kind of like water. This water also, uh, it's got some inertia, uh, it doesn't change. So what I did was I just averaged the last few values uh, so that it would, uh, to, to remove some noise and uh, allow it to uh, uh, have that behavior. And if you drop it, it stays green. Because so, it, if, so if it doesn't, so it's reading the acceleration in this direction and this direction, it's ignoring this direction. So if I hold it upright, been very still, it turns green. And so, if I, why don't you hold it up as high as you can? It's got too much spin. But if you drop it far enough into a pillow, it'll, it'll stay green. green. If it's zero, it's zero. There, see it? Green flash. So, it's a really good way of dynamically doing it, but you can see there's some issues there. They have some other ones up here you can play with that small children like to walk around. But um, we played around with that and we said, well, that's complicated and it's a little hard to do and you have to learn how to program hardware and you have to buy hardware and that's just not going to catch up. So we said that was too much. But we started there. We should also try to make a device that would do derivatives and intervals mechanically and look back at, there are some patents from the 1880s or something and he started to deconstruct that and it got pretty hairy and so we said, nah, no, nobody's going to make those except him. So we said what we really need is sort of scaffolded replacement for all of calculus. We'll have to figure out where you're going to start. You're not going to start in the same place as you would otherwise. Um, and you couldn't ask them to learn too many things. You couldn't ask them to learn four different kinds of software and hardware and electronics and just have one thing. So we said, okay, we're going to base everything on this open scab, which is sort of, if you know Java, you can pick it up in a couple. So just 3D printing. Okay. So if you take a traditional calculus class, the first thing you learn about are limits. And you can hold to that. And a limit, what a limit says, you can show pretty easily, but it's pretty complicated to do with algebra. So it's usually taught is pages and pages and pages of algebra. So I have some curve. And what Newton figured out, just two first. Just let, me, let me hear that. Okay. So what Newton figured out was, you know, I can do a lot of interesting things if I take a curve and I break it into boxes, because it's a lot easier to think about individual boxes and it's a complicated curve, right? So I can break something, pretty complicated surface into boxes. But the boxes are kind of big, it doesn't fit very well, right? And so the boxes get a little smaller, a little better. Still not great. The boxes get a little smaller. It's pretty good. And then if the boxes get even smaller, oops, and I turn it the right way around, it fits perfectly. Mm -hmm. Ish. Within the limits of how much I discretize. Okay, as the first two weeks of calculus two that the quiz of me. I mean if you do it this way, it's like, well, yeah, you know. But if you do it the other way, it's like, you know, all these symbols and stuff. Then you can go back and learn that, and you'll have something to hang on to. So that was our first one, the model of limits. We've had teachers try to do it. <laughs> Look over there. The other thing, which is a little more subtle, and uh, we'll, just, uh, we'll, do, we'll do this as a... Just grab. I got this grab. Oh, oh, no. 
So this one we're going to do is live live teaching demo. Jerry, your neighbor. Jerry, keep one. Okay. Yeah. So it's even better. Um, so each one of these is two different math functions. Uh, simplest one here is uh, this one's straight line, y equals x. Uh, this one, it's curved is y equals x squared. So the, uh, if we look at the slope of this line, this curve, anywhere along uh, the curve, the slope of it will be the corresponding value on this other uh, line. And if we want to, uh, to figure out how much area is under starting at zero here and going to some random point on this other curve. So we, we cut it off there and we, we try to find the area of this piece. It's the same as the height of this one. So that's the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, in very brief. In plastic. In plastic. And so. you have different functions we play around with how to orient the two axes and things so you have different pieces of that. And so that's so, normally taught at the end of a second semester of calculus, because you you go on and on about what an integral is and on and on about what a derivative is. But if you can actually see them together, you say, oh, well, okay. You sit there and play with it and think about it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. She, she started trying to explain these concepts to me separately, and, and I got angry when I found out that uh, that doesn't, uh, that usually doesn't come up that these functions are inverses of one another until much later. Yeah, and you, know, and you can stare at those for a while and then you can yourself. We're also playing for the book and of, um, looking at partial derivatives, and this is very, this is oh, like three days old. So this is a surface here, and for those of you who haven't taken calculus yet, basically on a, that's a one, a one variable version. If you have a surface, you have to think about, well, it's changing this way and changing this way. And you do something called a partial derivative where you hold the variable on this level constant, you take a little slice, and then you think about how is it changing. So this slice here is changing in this direction as this curve shows. And so you can take any random slice there and have the partial derivative. And then you can do the same thing at, at right angles, except when print of the clock and we need it so this is really, really work in progress. But we're thinking about you know, what are the best ways to show this and how to think about it. And it's going to be these sets of models like that. But that's a concept that people have trouble with. And, and you know, you look at it and say, yeah. And they can think about it and reason about it and look at that and show it. Okay, so we have another thing called Predator Prey. We have a big demo in here. You have to have these for everybody, but you can share with people. You have to share. Yes, back here. And you can share with Some of the print quality is, my printer was in the process of quality, so the print quality is not as good. Here. Back there, or you can actually you can. So um, this is called the predator prey function. Uh, so you have uh, it's demonstrating the behavior you get in populations uh, when you have, say, rabbits and foxes. Uh, so you start out with uh, uh, a few rabbits, not a lot of foxes. Uh, the uh, uh, the population of rabbits starts to increase because rabbits do what rabbits do. Um, and uh, the population starts increasing, and suddenly there's this huge supply of rabbits, uh, and there's a lot for the foxes to eat. So the foxes uh, start eating, and their population starts to increase. So this is time, and this is foxes. 
and this is X. So you have you have those three dimensions in your mind. So population of foxes starts to increase, but then as that happens, uh, they start eating all the rabbits, and there aren't enough rabbits to go around. So the the, uh, the rabbit population starts to fall, and uh, when the rabbit population starts to fall, there's not enough food for the foxes anymore, and their population starts to decrease, which allows the rabbit population to start increasing again, so it's cyclical. Uh, and if you look along, it kind of makes a spiral uh, shape. So if you look up this, uh, this equation on Wikipedia, you see this projection, you see this projection, and you see this projection that kind of shows you the, the shape uh, of the cycle, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't tell you how, it doesn't show you how they relate. Uh, so this is this is all three on one set of axes. And this is population biology. That's it's two two first order differential equations that normally again would be you know maybe a second or a third semester calculus class with differential equations. But you know there it is, right? And you could change this and reason with it. Uh, an interesting thing that happens is um, is that. Uh, we also played around with different ways. These are all equivalent models, and you can come up and look at them later. Um, when you print something on a 3D printer, you have a curve that's going through space like this. And when you print it on a 3D printer, you have to have something underneath it for it to print on, because you're printing up from the, from the base. And so you, you, can, you can print it with any of the three variables on the bottom, and they're equivalent. So we spent a lot of time. You can do some overhangs. This, this was printed in this orientation. These are pretty nasty overhangs. Uh, that you see there, it's a little squishy there. Uh, it barely came out. But, uh, uh, so these ones are all, you know, fully supported. Every everything has something directly under it. But uh, it's it's kind of hard to see what's what. Um, th there's no origin on this. The origin is off over here somewhere. You can't see it. So we, we switch to uh, to this well, one. We never have zero rabbits or zero foxes because that's the state that doesn't go anywhere, right? So you know, you have facts and rabbits and foxes and things like this. So you have to do some things. So this is this is uh, zero zero here, or here actually here's zero zero there. And so uh, one of the things we're playing with is how to show where zero zero is uh, a model because when we're here we can point to it, but we've also been handing them to blind blind students and they you know they, they like to get the overall feel of it and then they say okay now where do I start? So we we're chatting a little bit about good ways to do that. And, uh, producial markers that don't get carried away. And as an old numerical analyst, um, we, we originally did this and it blew, it blew up. Um, it spiraled out of control and then I realized that our, our simulation step size was a little, a little too big and so it was numerically unstable. So we had unstable versions, I had dust off my textbooks that haven't been dusted off in that time. You learn a lot by doing this, which is really interesting to me. So that's a picture of what you just talked about. And that's the, the three that you can come up with. So our big questions um, that we're working on right now as we, as we lay out this book, and we've got some answers to them, is if you're going about this way, what order are you teaching? Um, because you want to be able to tie back. The book is being marketed as a supplemental textbook, but we think places may teach an alternative version of calculus just using it, and that's sort of our goal. Um, so what order you teach it in our conclusion is we're going to teach, start with the fundamental theorem and spread everything from there, and go back and pick up a lot of things. Um, and one of the best anchor concepts, you know, to use, um, you know, we think that this equation is a really nice example of all kinds of things, so we'll have this one, we have, um, you know, the, uh, the predator prey, we have some interesting vector, and it's rapidly getting into tensors, and we're trying to figure out how to handle that. And you know, what are the best anchor concepts? We have some things with transforms. And how much do you connect to traditional calculus, whatever that means? You know, we, we took this to one textbook publisher, and said, oh, well, um, if you reorder it to be the traditional order, then, you know, we'll think about it. It's like, you, you know, yeah, get it. Yeah. Thanks. Did you buy his lunch? No. So that was the end of that. And, um, but you know, it has to be different. And it's, if it's too different, then you can't tie into a regular class. So how do you manage that? And so we're, we're talking to the publisher about that. And we got some really good feedback from the publisher's peer review process about that. And so um, 
we have right now six books out. We always have to, we're a two-person commercial company. Um, we always have to ask, I do an ad, sorry about that. So we're called on Scripton. Um, when we started the company, we were going to call ourselves Now What? Because that's what people said when they bought a 3D printer. But it looked funny as a domain. It looked like to know what happened, you know. So non-scriptum means unwritten, so it's an ironic name that we try to do, try to write down things that people don't understand and uh, make them understandable for them. So non-scriptum, now I'll see that. And if you want to track us down, that's where we are. And we would love discussion, feedback, come up and set up comments. And thank you so much for having us. So what's your typical process for working in schools and teachers? Like these models seem like they're printed on fairly high quality machines that I'm assuming most schools might not have. Like how does the process go? Who makes the models all that time? Yeah, they, they look pretty because they're printed on a pretty high quality machine. Uh, but uh, all of our models are specifically designed to be able to, to print on any machine. It might not look as pretty, but it's it'll look at something. I guess I'm wondering where you, especially with the calculus models where the step size matters, or like where do you end up losing some of that? Well, the st step size matters in the calculation, uh, but uh, the step, step size is, is too small to, to actually show up in the model anyway. Okay. So it's, it's, yeah. but, the, uh, but on the, for, for the models that are from our previous books, one of our design guidelines for ourselves is it has to print on a crummy, out-of-tune, Printer in school because you know most. Because uh, that's what most. <laughs> yeah. And so it has to print on a printer that's barely hanging together. Most of ours are designed to print without support. We're a little less worried about that in the capitals one on the premise that if somebody's teaching capitals this way, they probably have a few good printers. But we're staying away from anything that needs a resin printer or anything. Now these were printed on a printer that now has a $300 phone, which is why we. But, um, and we like but, you know, it's a, it's a fair question, and you know, we really struggle to keep them all simple to do. And, and they look good, because that's what we train people to do, and any model would bring out the public house to look good. Yes, ma'am. Um, the school does not include the printer, just go on the website, like Shapeways, and order the 3 d print for their school, and then they'll just send them out high quality printer. Yeah, so the, the question, the day I'll just repeat the question for you. So um, the question was, can you print these out someplace? So um, you could, because what the way this is going to work is that the models will be open source, and they'll be in a repository that's open someplace, and the someplace is under discussion right now, where that will be. Um, we're also going to try to put together some deals with some small service bureaus that will understand these models and what they are and have them ready as packages because we know that that will be desired there. So we're working on partnering for that. Any other questions? Welcome to the models. Yes, sir. <coughs> the, uh, what we have shown today, I mean, is very interesting. Uh, but <coughs> the first thing that comes to my mind is that <coughs> the previous slide, that is, okay, that's interesting, intuitively, it's nice, but mm, how do we know that this works from the uh, education point of view? I mean, did, have you had any people who took these ideas, made a pile of study, and then showed that this way, in the other way, it's better? Any evidence? So Not yet. So, so, so far, I'm a test subject. He's a test subject. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm both generating models and, uh, and uh, learning calculus through them. Um, we, uh, we hope to pilot it uh, uh, with some other students uh, uh, after we have more of it put together. But also, you know, our, our goal is to write a, and at the moment, this is focused around writing a book that will be an interesting supplement. And so, you know, at some level, we, we go with our gut a little bit. I mean, in terms of the math being right, you know, that I'm pretty comfortable that, that I can do that. Check by Mr. Never Mr. Mm -hmm. Detail over here. Um, but otherwise, if anybody wants to pilot it or test it, you know, we've been talking to the team a little bit. 
anybody who wants to test it as we go, we're happy to have company within our within our timeline when we have to deliver the book, which is terrifyingly short. <laughs> Just to provide a little bit more information about how we're collaborating. Um, my interest from the educator point of view is how do we get teachers, um, kind of how to make this more accessible to teachers. So sort of did tag along with the previous questions. Um, but there's definitely a lot of room to be done to really pilot this and look at the efficacy of this approach um, pedagogically. Yeah, this is very much a popular trade book, not so much a textbook. And so for this one. So it's, you know, here's an approach. You know, as an interesting thought experiment, what if Newton had a 3D printer try it? And you know, because it is so different than most things out there, we figured that that's pretty much the only way to get people to try it is if there's a book. Um, we put we had it on a website for a while, and we sort of had lackluster interest, and everybody said, "Where's the book?" You know, I won't try it till it's a book. And then people say, "Well, you should try it before it's a book." And you, you know, what do you do? Right? So you write the book, and then you see what happens, and then it's, that's why God made second editions. <laughs> but good point. And, uh, and I guess you have talked to, to mathematicians. So, uh, for example, I made, I sent the message to my daughter, who is a doctor student in mathematics. So I said, how do you, how do you, what do you think about it? I mean, the, the ones who have gone through a, you know, many years of understanding, <coughs> trying, trying to understand mathematics and how they react. Yeah, so in terms of mathematicians, that's easy. Uh, you know, I, I live a couple of miles from a large university uh, where I have acquaintances and I have a, an old friend who is a curmudgeonly mathematician who I won't name, having described him that way. And so we, we've definitely laid this on mathematicians and they, they enjoy it, you know, and they, they get excited about it and they give us lots of suggestions. And so in terms of it being right, most of the equations we're doing are really well understood things that, you know, they're published all over the place in the pictures and it's easy. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about them being numerically wrong or mathematically wrong, it's more, you know, how do you make them as accessible in all senses of the word as possible? That's the hard question right now. Um, I also taught um, um, math for people who are terrified at math at, uh, at a college some eons ago. And it was all adults who had failed math their whole lives. And they had to take an equivalent of Algebra one to graduate with a degree. On the first night of class, people would cry. You know, I hate math, I stink in math, and I told my children I was going to get a degree, and they left this class till the end, you know, this stuff. And what I would do is I'd get a box and toys, the box was X, and the toys were, you know, 1 through N, and we did, you know, 2 plus X equals 8, the box. And they would do this for a while, and then they'd get mad at me, and they'd say, this is easy, and they'd wait for it. Then they'd cry again. You know, so my hypothesis, based on nothing, is that a lot of people who sneak at math are tactile learners, and they're served poorly by being written at on a board. And um, and so this is for that population. I think a lot of people who go on who become people who make things. I think are poorly served by writing on a board. And so this is you know it started out as calculus for machinists. You know, and um, it sort of has evolved into this other thing. And it's still evolving, so just as we finish the book, we'll probably hate it and want to go in the second edition. That's how these things go. Any other questions, comments? Well, it's been awesome having you all here. You can all come up and tell me privately that of all the things we're doing wrong <laughs> when the video's off. And uh, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, so come and play the book. I do want those back, by the way. Oh, yeah.